Suggestions for Students of Psychology, Part 5, The Moral Nature. 1. The Moral Nature. When we think of ourselves as producing changes which affect the welfare of other beings, we experience moral consciousness. The first requisite of moral consciousness is recognition of the existence of other beings. The second is respect for their rights, which are such of the conditions which they desire as will not interfere with the welfare of other beings. In a young child, the moral consciousness is not as yet developed, the consciousness of his own existence still taking great precedence over his consciousness of the existence of other beings. His own desires are supreme. He has not yet become conscious of his power to affect the welfare of others and so feels little respect for their desires. At this stage of development, he would be likely to interfere with many of the rights of others if he were not restrained by the law of obedience. Later, by judicious training, his volitions may be made amenable to the law of reason and to the moral law allow for others the same conditions which you desire for yourself. Rights of Moral Beings The following are some of the rights of a moral being. Life, opportunity to maintain his instrument of expression. Expression, opportunity to manifest his thoughts, emotions, and volitions, except when such expression interferes with the welfare of others. Freedom, Opportunity to act according to his own will, except when his activities interfere with the welfare of others. Happiness. The satisfaction of specific desires when their satisfaction does not interfere with the welfare of others. Justice. Equal opportunity with others in the pursuit of life, expression, freedom, and happiness, and equal treatment with others when his rights seem to conflict with theirs. The sense of duty. Respect for the rights of others leads us to feel pleasure in performing acts which contribute to their welfare and to condemn ourselves when we interfere with it. That activity of moral sensibility which leads us to perform right moral acts is called the sense of duty. In any situation, it is our duty to act in such a manner as we think will contribute most to the welfare of other beings. In order to determine what our duty in any situation may be, we are obliged to imagine ourselves in the positions occupied by those beings whose welfare will be affected by our actions. We then determine what our own desires would be under those conditions. The sense of duty then leads us to perform such acts as we think will contribute most to the welfare of all concerned. The moral problems which confront us are many and varied. In each situation, new elements are involved. But certain principles are established in the moral consciousness which may be formulated as follows. 1. The desire for life, expression, freedom, and happiness is universal. Therefore, it is our duty to exert our power in such a manner as will contribute most to the conditions which will satisfy these desires for all. 2. In our personal relationships with human beings, we expect each other to fulfill the agreements involved in these relationships. It is therefore our duty in any personal relationship to fulfill the agreement made in entering or maintaining it. The perplexing moral problems which often confront us arise from the fact that we have made conflicting agreements. We drift into many relationships without realizing what obligations are involved in them. It is our duty then to study every relationship into which we enter that we may understand its nature and make only such agreements as will harmonize with our ideals and present obligations. 2. Character The way in which a person is inclined to act toward his fellow beings is called character. We have said that the soul is a radiant center of love whose nature is to seek unity with all spirit. 
in the chart, the center A represents the soul consciousness in which we realize unity with the universal spirit and are superior to all sense of limitation. The sphere capital B represents self-consciousness in which we realize our individuality and the need of expression. The sphere capital C represents the moral consciousness in which we recognize the existence and respect the rights of other beings. The spheres small a, b, c represent the mind through which the soul expresses its power and receives knowledge of the external universe. The habits of the mind, as we have seen, modify both the expression of the soul's love and its consciousness of the external universe. The perfect character is the one in which the moral consciousness is dominated by the soul and expresses its universal love. This state of being is possible only when the habits of the mind are such as to allow the soul's love to flow through it in all directions. With many individuals, the mind is like a shell, preventing or greatly modifying the expression of the soul. The shell of mental habit allows the soul to be expressed in some directions, but not in others, so that a balanced all-around character is hard to find. Balance of character is the foundation of a noble and useful life. When all the powers of the mind are well-developed and obedient to the soul, every object of thought becomes the occasion of thoughts, feelings, and actions which express the soul's love and contribute to the welfare of others. Depth of Character With reference to the depth of character which they manifest, persons may be classified as superficial, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. Referring to the chart, let X represent an object of thought. The lines CX, BX, AX, and capital CX represent respectively the course of the lines of impression and expression in these four types of character. Superficial. The superficial type of character is entirely enslaved by external powers and conditions. Its opinions are dictated by other minds. Its actions are governed by circumstances. Its scope of consciousness is very narrow, for most of the impressions which enter such a mind are never recognized. The few which are received occasion no original ideas and are acted upon in accordance with the habits imposed by external powers and conditions. The intellectual development of this type is very deficient, and only physical sensibility is found to be active. So the majority of the impressions it receives penetrate no nearer to the soul than the line small cx to the center, capital A, and the soul is thus shut away from the environment by false mental habits. Emotional the emotional type of character is a little deeper than the superficial. It is inclined to allow the love of the soul to be expressed whenever it is brought into contact with experiences which occasion feelings of pleasure. But when it encounters experiences of a seemingly unpleasant nature, its reaction from them is so great as to be a complete obstruction to the soul's love. The first impression it receives of any experience is acted upon. It makes no effort to modify its judgments. Hence, it is largely governed by circumstances, and only under pleasant conditions does it allow the soul free expression. The depth of the moral activities of this type is indicated by the line BX. Intellectual the intellectual type is freer than the emotional in that it exerts the power of reason to modify its judgments so that in many cases it is able to find reasons why an experience is good which would be declared evil by the emotional mind. Thus it dissolves the barriers of the soul's expression which are allowed in the emotional and superficial minds. It carries the impressions it receives nearer the soul than either of the others. 
In the superficial mind, volitions are governed by habit, in the emotional by feeling, but in the intellectual mind, the volitions are the expressions of reason and emotion. The line AX indicates the depth of the moral activities in this type of character. Spiritual. The spiritual type of mind finds good in all experiences. It considers all phenomenon as the expressions of the spiritual beings which produce them and as a means of spiritual communion. This is the highest type of mind and produces the richest and deepest type of character. A person whose mind is thus trained will not only find good where others see nothing but evil, but he will discover values and experiences which others consider insignificant. All his sensibilities are highly developed. He takes pleasure in the pursuit of knowledge, the contemplation of beauty, and the performance and appreciation of right moral acts. He enjoys the pleasures of the senses so far as they contribute to the welfare of his whole being. But he is not disturbed by error and ugliness, wrong moral acts on the part of others, or physical pain, knowing that in his unity with the infinite power, he is able to withstand and overcome all these things. The depth of the moral activities of this type is indicated by the line capital CX. Formation of Character In the formation of character, there are many influences brought to bear upon the individual, and it is important to understand their relative values. 1. The Influence of Heredity The mental habits transmitted to the mind through heredity and prenatal influence are the basis of character, although it is possible to greatly modify them. 2. The Influence of Environment All the content of thought is derived from the environment. The first mental activities are in reference to the immediate environment, which is usually an extension of the influences of heredity. Hence, the habits transmitted through heredity are usually fostered in early years. 3. The Influence of Education the intellectual habits are formed by the systematic training of the school. We have seen how largely they govern the habits of sensibility and will. The kinds of objects and subjects of thought presented to the young mind and the methods of thinking it is trained to use exert great fluence in the evolution of character. 4. The Influence of Experience the sphere of the mind's activities is constantly being enlarged through experience. This tends to deepen and broaden the character. However, we are inclined to ignore certain phases of experience and to give special attention to others. So the usual influence of experience is to strengthen mental habits already formed. 5. The Influence of Ideals the ideals which we form by combining ideas of ourselves and ideas of the admirable qualities and acts of other persons form active centers in the mind which often take supremacy over other ideas and dominate our thoughts, feelings, and actions, thus exerting a powerful influence in the formation of character. 6. The Influence of Religious Experiences any experience which leads to think of ourselves as part of the infinite power is a religious experience. Such experiences awaken the soul and enable it to overcome the limitations of the mind. They are most conducive to the development of a deep and balanced character. End of Part 5 The Moral Nature